Welcome to the Gregory Neesmith Show, a special delivery of underdog stuff. It's also a special mix of politics, culture, and personal development stuff, too, for underdogs out there. All right, so let's talk about the howling dog. And, and stick with me, because the howling dog will, will make sense. It's going to relate to some of the stuff going on in politics, going on in the culture, going on in our personal lives. And it's almost appropriate, right? We talk underdog stuff here. And I, ha- I just was like, I got to find a story that has a dog in it. It just, it just seems like that would be appropriate. All right. The Howling Dog. Bear with me. I be- I, it's going to make sense. I guarantee you. And if you haven't heard this story before, I think you're going to like it. All right. It goes a little something like this. I moved into a new neighborhood and you know, I liked it. It's a cool place. And you know, there's neighbors and across the way from me, there was a neighbor named Mr. This, what name do we want to give him? Mr. Um, Henry. And so Henry had a dog and you know, I lived there for a couple of days and all of a sudden it's been a couple of weeks and a couple of months. And I used to always hear this howling dog. This dog is barking and howling, barking and howling. And I thought, oh, you know, maybe, maybe the dog's just going through something. Maybe it'll pass. But no, Henry's dog just kept howling. Day after day, week after week. Month, month. And so finally one day I got fed up. I'm like, this howling dog thing is going on for too long, just howling. Woo, woo, woo. I clearly have to work on my howling dog impersonation. So, but stick with me. Howling dog. Weeks, months on that. Finally, I go over to my neighbor. I see Henry sitting on his porch, chilling. I look over, I see a dog that's still howling, and it's the dog that I've been hearing. Dog's howling, but Henry, chilling. I'm like, Henry, is that your dog? He's like, yeah, all relaxed, like like his dog's not howling right now. And I said, Henry, um, you know, that's your, your dog and all, and um it's it's uh howling. Um why why does your, your dog keep howling? And Henry says to me, because my dog's sitting on a nail. And I said, um, uh mm, okay, sitting on a on a nail. All right, okay, cool, got it, got it. Um, why doesn't he just get up off that nail and then Henry takes a bit of a deep breath and he says as he sips on his coffee and he says to me the dog hasn't gotten up off the nail because the nail isn't in deep enough yet Let that sink in for a second. Literally and figuratively. The howling dog, howling for months, weeks, days on end. I asked the dog's owner, why is the dog howling? Henry says he's sitting on a nail. And I said, well, then why doesn't the dog just get up off the nail? And Henry says because the nail's not in deep enough who's stealing that story what does that story mean to you what are you howling about 
because as I heard this story, I realized that there's a lot of times that I'm howling about stuff too. But clearly the pain isn't enough. Or my motivation isn't enough. So all I do is howl. I complain about the job that I go to every day that I don't like, but I don't get up off that job because the nail's not in deep enough. Oh, I'm in that relationship. It's all right. Actually, maybe I've been in those relationships sometimes and they kind of suck. But I guess they didn't suck enough because I'm still there. Nail wasn't in deep enough, but I'm going to keep howling and complaining about it. A lot of people talking about, oh, they don't like Trump. They don't like the Senate. They don't like the House of Representatives howling a lot. But then they won't go out and vote this November. Guess the nail isn't in deep enough. Throughout the show, I want you to, and I'm going to do the same, and be very reflective about what am I still howling about? And won't get up because the nail's not in deep enough. Now, with that being said, I've learned over the years in business and politics and life, I normally change. And the truth is, the same goes for you for one of three reasons. One, I come up with some big idea, something I'm so passionate about that it just gets me into action. Like I wanted to start Underdog Stuff, the company. The idea was how to support each other and rediscovering how special we are and to get our swagger back. Idea was big enough, passionate about it, that even the fears, the doubt I had wasn't enough to stop me. So I was just so excited about stuff. So that's one reason we change. We just, we get a big idea. For some people, it's becoming a parent. And they're like, Man, I got this life to nurture, to care for, to raise. I'm going to be the best person I can, be the best parent I can. And so whatever they might have been doing up until that point, they're like, no, I got a new reason to be different, to move differently. That's one reason. The second is, it's true for me, and the truth is, it's true for you too. The second reason, oftentimes we make a change. is we get in touch with how we really feel about how things have been going in a certain circumstance, situation, relationship. I know for me, it was with my job. Had it for 16 years. Sweet 16, that's a long time to be at the same place. And one day, my dad asked me, after getting a recent promotion a few years ago, he goes, son, how you loving the job, the new job? And for the first time ever, I paused in my tracks and answered the question honestly and said, I like it, but I don't love it. Because I got in touch with how I really felt about my job and that I was in a rut and that I was sad about it. and Felt like I was just not really being me, just going through the motions. So I got in touch with my emotions. And oftentimes when we get in touch with our real emotions, that can trigger us to be like, yeah, you know what? I don't want to be sad anymore. I'm going to leave this job. I'm scared to do it, but I'd rather be scared than sad. And I'd rather try than just live in this, you know, walking dead kind of frame of mind. Shout out to Zeke who said, or even registered to vote. And Zeke's talking about the fact that I said some of us have been howling like that dog I talked about 
sitting on a nail. And the reason why we haven't gotten up because the nail's not in deep enough. People talking about they hate Trump, but they registered to vote. Shout out to Zeke. Because for some of us, Trump's nail ain't in deep enough. And so unfortunately, that brings me to the third reason why I change or you change is because something traumatic happens. Something tragic happens. Like a nail gets in deep enough that we're like, oh, now I'm going to do something. My commitment is that I don't and you don't have that be the number one reason why we changed this summer. Let's not wait for the nail to get deep enough to stop howling. And don't worry, I know folks like to get into some politics. We're going to get into it. I've been keeping an eye on Trump and the border and some other things. There's also some underreported news. Yes, big deal about separating children from their parents at the border. But guess what? There's also some other children being separated from their parents. And some of them are from Haiti and from the Sudan and some other countries. So we're going to talk about that too. It's Voice of the Underdog, and we make sure we cover all the angles of certain stories, especially stuff that's getting underreported. But back to the howling dog. Three reasons why people change. And if you just joined the show at the bottom of the hour, let me recap the howling dog story so it'll make sense because I want to read what Zeke just said about one of the reasons why we change. So let me tell you the howling dog story one more time. I'll give you the quick version. I moved into the neighborhood, like my new place. But every night, every day, weeks on end, I kept hearing, kept hearing a howling dog, howling, 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 keep howling. I finally go over to my neighbor, Henry. I'm like, Henry. I see Henry on his porch chilling, sipping on some coffee. I look over to the left, I see a dog, the dog that's been howling that I've been hearing about and hearing. I said, Henry, is that your dog? He said, yeah, man, that's my dog. I'm like, yo, why's your dog howling? <laughs> Henry says, because he's sitting on a nail. And I'm like, um, oh, okay, all right, cool. Sitting on the nail, got it. And um, so Henry, why doesn't the dog just get off the nail? And then Henry sits back in his chair, takes a little sip of his coffee, looks back at me and says, dog won't get up because the nail's not in deep enough. Let that sink in for a second. What are you howling about? that the nail's not in deep enough. Right, that job you keep going to that you don't like, but you don't dislike it enough to leave it, so you just keep howling about it. Nail's not in deep enough. There's three reasons why we normally get up off that nail. One, we get a new idea that just gets us going. We're like, oh, I found my purpose to be on the earth. I'm gonna go do it no matter what. That's one. Two, we get in touch with our feelings. Like I said, I realized how sad I was. Another example, I was in foster care and then adopted. I used to say that, oh, you know, it doesn't matter if I meet my biological parents. Yet and still, we get taught all this stuff about, I should learn about African-American history, the slave trade. I should learn about my ancestors and I stand on the shoulders of Martin Luther King, so the truth, all this other stuff. And I used to say, I don't need to know the ancestors that gave birth to me. That was just my way of making excuses. But when I finally took the time to just sit still for a second and realize how I really felt about potentially going my entire life, not seeing the people who gave birth to me, I realized that I was sad, that I was curious, that I would regret if I didn't do it. And finally acknowledging that pain drove me to go into action. Another reason why we do stuff is the howling dog story. Sometimes we don't do something until something dramatic, tragic happens to the nails in deep enough. Some of y'all won't leave your job till you get fired. Then the nail is in deep. And then Zeke says, there's a fourth reason why I, you, him, us, we, underdog, decided to make a change. He says, when the lack of change or motivation is costing us money.
cash rules everything around me. Cream, get the money. Dollar, dollar bill, y'all. Yeah, man, some of us. And it's so true. How many of us have heard stories about rags to riches or someone went bankrupt or someone lost all their money or someone was down on their last luck? Something was costing them money, their livelihood, being able to put food on the table, food and shelter. Something's costing them money. Or in other situations, right? You're in a business deal or a partnership with somebody and all of a sudden maybe they're stealing money or they're not handling the business relationships you have well and they're costing you money because you're losing customers. And so to Zeke's point, it's like, yeah, you're like, oh, we out. I'm done. Gone. It's over. You cost me money. I'm out. Question to think about for the rest of the show. What are you howling about? We about to talk a little Trump. And I'll be honest. A lot of y'all just howling, nailing in deep enough. You ain't registered to vote yet. You ain't never called a congressman, congresswoman. You haven't donated to any of the organizations that would represent some of the Haitian, Sudan, refugees, some of the folks coming in over the border right now on the Mexican, Mexico and Texas border. You haven't registered to vote, haven't voted in years. You just howling. When's the nail going to be in deep enough? Shout out to Tango, a.k.a. Don, a.k.a. Roy. Triangle offense in the building. Appreciate when my people show up and show out. Shout out to Don. Check it in online. All right. News in the culture. Politics. I'm almost certain. A lot of you have been following what's going on at the border. Um, parents been separated from the children, children separated from the parents. And Trump kind of did something about it. Kind of, sort of, maybe, I think, we'll see. We're gonna have a lot of happy people. We're going to have strong, very strong borders, but we're going to keep the families together. I didn't like the sight or the feeling of families being separated. Ivanka feels very strongly. My wife feels very strongly about it. Uh, I feel very strongly about it. I think uh, anybody with a heart would feel very strongly about it. We don't like to see families separated. At the same time, we don't want people coming into our country illegally. This takes care of the problem. Anybody with a heart. I'm starting to question how much heart a lot of these politicians have. And not just the obvious one who was just talking. I'm talking about the ones in the Senate and the House. I'm talking about the folks in the president's cabinet. And sometimes every now and then some folks speak up. But in my opinion, they just howling. Like that howling dog still sitting on the nail because it ain't in deep enough. Maybe it'll be in deep enough when Trump veers off course and starts to talk about angel families. Parents of children that have unfortunately been killed potentially by someone who is not a citizen of the United States and now making a case that they are also permanently separated from their family members and somehow again taking us off course in a disingenuous, stupid, and off the point remark. And of course, we care about those who have lost loved ones especially the violence and the crime. But remember, we do both here at the Gregory Neesman Show. We can care about that, and then we can also care about the fact that we are choosing to separate kids from their parents when they come across the border, and we could do something different. And Trump did sign an executive order 
on June 20th to end family separations. And that will allow children and parents who cross the border to be detained together. However, for the approximately 2,300 children that have already, already been separated, we don't know what's going to happen. So I guess we all still howling, right? When's the nail going to be in deep enough? When's it going to be in deep enough that folks start to protest? Even more. When folks start to call their politicians, even more. We're focusing money to organizations that can represent legally these children and these adults. When are people going to register to vote? November's going to be here in the blink of an eye. Are you going to be howling like that dog, or is the nail going to be in deep enough that you get out and act? And speaking of the spirit of both, we can care about what's going on at the border with a lot of folks of Central and South American, Central and South Americans fleeing their countries, trying to head north for a better life. But I also don't want to forget about the underreported underdogs that aren't from specifically those parts of the world. In the past year, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has announced the cancellation of temporary protections from deportation for immigrants from six countries, Sudan, Nicaragua, Haiti, Nepal, El Salvador, Honduras, amid Donald Trump's toughening immigration stance. A lot of folks from those countries, shout out to some of my good friends, especially some of my Haitian brothers and sisters. Shout out to Steve, Stanley. Um, a lot of Haitian immigrants and folks from some of those other countries I just named were part of what was called TPS, which I believe stands for the Temporary Protection Oh, I got to find temporary protected status. Folks that came here legally because stuff was going down, earthquakes or political unrest, we welcomed them here and gave them a place to be safe, to live. And so it's been estimated that about 300,000 people from those six countries are part of the temporary protective status that is going to be ending soon. And those 300,000 people have 127,000 U.S. born kids, which means those kids could also be separated from their family soon. And so I want us to keep our eye on what's going on with what's going on at the Mexico Texas border. But you know what we do here? We talk about the underreported too. Let's not forget about the temporary protected status folks from those six countries, which include the likes of Haiti, 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 Haiti and the Sudan and Nepal. Rightfully so, we're concerned about those 2,300 kids that have been separated at the Mexico, Texas, U.S. border. I want us to also have our eye on the 127,000 potential children who were born here, U.S. citizens, parents were here legally under a program that Donald Trump is now ending. How come they can't be put in the become citizen line? They've been here legally, tracked, watched, ain't done nothing but just living the American dream, and now they got to go? and be separated from their families? I thought we were a country that believed in God. Sunday, I just feel like saying that they were gods. And we believed in families. Isn't that what they say, the evangelist, what is it? Christian conservatives, the evangelicals, gods. Love the world, God. We care for people, protect families. God, 
He loves you and so do I. Well, I guess God doesn't love the 127,000 potential children going to be separated from their parents who were here legally, actually, in addition to the 2300 that's been in the news. You know, I like to talk about both. So if you're not going to be that howling dog, and if you're not going to wait for the nail to be in deep enough, you're just going to get up off it. Get up off it and call your congressperson. Get up off of it and register to vote. Get up off it and donate some money to the organizations that support these people. Get up off the nail and go protest. As always, we'll keep an eye on what's going on, not just at the border, but also with the folks that are part of the Temporary Protective Status Program that is scheduled to end because the Trump administration ended it and will not give those folks a path to citizenship or ability to stay in this country. What are you howling about? You know, we talk underdog stuff. It's appropriate, obviously, that I, every now and then, have a story that has a dog in it. See what I did there. But think about that. How many times have you been metaphorically sitting on a nail and howling and don't get up? In a bad relationship that's not working for you. But all you do is just keep complaining about it to all your family and friends. Why? Because the nail's not in deep enough. Going to that job every day that you don't like. I've been there. I did it. I went to a job every day. I liked it, but I didn't love it. I kept going. The nail wasn't in deep enough. Some of y'all won't leave the job till you get fired. <clears throat> the nail's not in deep enough. Some of y'all here howling about Donald Trump and ain't even registered to vote. Just howling. Nail's not in deep enough. I see politicians every day howling about Donald Trump and won't stand up to him because they think that by aligning with him, there are the Republican voters will continue to vote them in the office next time they're for re-election. Guess what? Nail's not in deep enough. What are you howling about? Most of us change for three reasons. We get a big idea something we're so passionate about, we find our purpose, our reason for living on this planet, we're like, I'm going to go do that. That's a cool way to rediscover your special stuff and get your swagger back. It's the ideal way. But it's only one way. Sometimes that just doesn't happen. Second way, you, I, we, we get in touch with our feelings. Like eventually I realize every day that I really didn't like my job. That I was sad that I wasn't pursuing my dreams. That I was sad I wasn't an entrepreneur. I was having regret, stress. I sat still long enough to realize that I wasn't feeling my current situation. The emotion sucked. So I made a change. And then lastly, like the howling dog, some of us don't do anything, me included, until something tragic, something dramatic happens, until the nail's in deep enough. What are you howling about? Speaking of howling, well, let me howl about Donald Trump for a second. You know, this dude wants to go to space. I want to send him to space, but he wants to go to space. There is unease tonight in many Haitian neighborhoods. He wants to go to space. That's, that's this clip right here. Very importantly, I'm hereby directing the Department of Defense and Pentagon to immediately begin the process necessary to establish a Space Force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. That's a big statement. We are going to have the Air Force and... Oh, let's play that one more time. Very importantly, I'm hereby directing the Department of Defense and Pentagon to immediately begin the process necessary to establish a Space Force as the sixth branch 
of the armed forces. That's a big statement. We are going to have the Air Force and we are going to have the Space Force, separate but equal. It is going to be something so important. General Dunford, if you would carry that assignment out, I would be very greatly honored also. Where's General Dunford? I can't with this dude. <laughs> Basically, Trump wants to create a sixth branch of the military called Space Force. And everybody but Trump thinks it's a terrible idea. Luckily, it would have to go through Congress before he can create the Space Force, and Congress will more than likely not approve it. <sighs> Congress actually can help us save us from a Space Force. Just, I don't know. Do, do you think it's a good idea? Business Insider shares that retired NASA astronaut Mark Kelly doesn't support it, and some members of Congress are also voicing their distaste for the idea. Kelly took to social media writing, quote, This is a dumb idea. The Air Force does this already. That is their job. What's next? We move submarines to the seventh branch and call it the under the sea force? Yeah. What you howling about? Please don't wait until the nail gets in deep enough. Just get up off the nail. Get in touch with how you're feeling about a situation that's not working or figure out something you really, really want instead of what you have right now. Go get it. And over the summer, we'll be talking about some of the ways to go get it. Some of the how do we get our swagger back? How do we rediscover our special stuff? And throughout the summer, we'll be talking about the swagger back commandments like change your address or change your life. Number two, get new friends ASAP. It's part of rediscovering your special stuff. It's part of getting your swagger back. 10 swagger back commandments. Number three, pick a destination. Once you know where you're at and once you know where you're going, you can start to map out the game plan. Number four, ain't no fun if the homies can't have none. That's my way of saying who you serving. Who's the community? Who's the tribe? Who are the people that you are offering value to, making a difference in their lives, solving a problem for it. Ain't no fun if the homies can't have none. It can't just be you eating out here. Life's better when other people are eating with you. Number four, stop kidding around. It's part of the 10 Swagger Back Commandments, how we rediscover our special stuff and get our swagger back. Based on some personal experiences, also coaching and consulting I've done over the years, some research I've done too, all to share the hookup on how we do this, getting our swagger back in business, politics, and life. Stop kidding around. There's some stuff I'm holding on to from my childhood that you're holding on to from your childhood, and you're making decisions based on your seven-year-old self. It's all good. It's natural. I do it. You do it, too. But in Stop Kidding Around, we talk about how to acknowledge that unlearn it, and move forward and start making decisions based on who you are now not who you've been. Number six, stop watching porn. Part of the 10 Swagger Back Commandments. I used to watch too much porn. It's just overkill. Compulsive, just too much. It's a bad habit. And Swagger Back Commandments, stop watching porn. We talk about habits, bad ones and identifying what they are for you specifically. Yours may not be stop watching porn, it might be something else. And how getting rid of those bad habits can be like rocket fuel for us to get our swagger back and keep it. Number seven, the three C's is part of getting our swagger back and keeping it. The idea of what we cut, what we continue, what we complete 
we can't just be going around making new resolutions all the time. I'm going to do this new, this new, this new. There's some stuff we need to get complete on. We need to cut. We need to continue. Also, who you're rolling with is the eighth commandment of getting your swagger back. We are the company we keep. And I'm excited that today we're going to have some good company. Patressa and Courtney coming through to talk yoga, jazz, and harmony. A lot of folks have every year something related to fitness as an aspiration or a declaration. Well, stay tuned because you'll get to learn some more about yoga. That might be your thing this summer. Might be your thing to try on. Number nine, cream, cash rules, everything around me. Cream, get the money. You can't talk about getting your swagger back and rediscovering your special stuff without talking about money. It ain't everything, but without it, it feels like it is. And countless studies have shown while once you get to a certain threshold, money isn't as important, but hey, you got to at least get to that threshold. And for a lot of you out there, underdogs trying to do side hustles or start new businesses or start new jobs, start families, money matters. And so we can't talk about getting our swagger back without talking about money. And that's number nine on the 10 swagger back commandments. And number 10, love life. And that's about making sure that there's love in your life. And that can be romantic love, friend love, family love, but also self-care, self-love. And that's just a preview of the 10 swagger back commandments. We'll be talking about them throughout the summer, especially in the context oftentimes of what's going on in the news and the culture. And you have my commitment that we get to explore together and give each other the hookup on how we rediscover our special stuff and get our swagger back. There's more to come. It's going to be a good summer. With that, as always, I leave you with my favorite quote. And if you listen to the show before, you can say it along with me. <laughs> Underdogs, can't nobody, and I mean nobody, can't nobody do it like you do it. Nobody.